So thank you for coming, everybody. It's nice that the room has uh, filled out a little bit more since the morning when there was like 10 people for the first presentation. Uh, must have been a fun night last night that I missed. Um, so I'm Ross Finman, so I'm going to be talking about Beyond ARKit and AR Core. So just for a survey here, um, it was done this morning, but who here is a developer? Eh, about half of you. OK, well, this talk is more for the developers of the audience, and then for everyone else, it'll be uh, more towards like educating themselves on the details of AR. So it, you've probably heard and seen a lot of people talking about, OK, AR is this huge future. There's so much potential with what it can do. Um, and it's really going to change the way that we use every, that we use kind of computers everywhere. But you also hear on the other side people talking about how they're hedging it. Oh, it's going to be a bit longer. Everything needs to wait. Now I'm going to be talking about why both of these uh, two sides are actually true, and then what is kind of the core thing that we need to address in order to get both of them to agree with each other. So, like my goal for this talk is to really like teach about what is new in augmented reality. You really need to understand like the details of the platform. And then I want to be able to show you guys kind of what is coming down the pipeline um, beyond ARKit. How do you think about like developing apps for it? What are the next steps? What are the new features that are all coming out? So first off, a little bit about my background and why hopefully you should listen to me, uh, minus the two people that are now leaving. Um, <laughs> Three. Uh, so then I am co-founder and CEO of Escher Reality. Um, so we just graduated from Y Combinator this summer, uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're a venture-backed company now based out of the Bay Area. We originally spun out of MIT, where I did a lot of my PhD work and some of the core technology behind this. So some of you in uh, AR may have heard of the term SLAM. My advisor actually coined the term SLAM. Um, so to get into a little bit more about the details, Let's talk about what is the current state of augmented reality. So like ARKit came out this summer, big bang, really changed the way that people are thinking about it. It's bringing it to hundreds of millions of devices that just got released yesterday. Um, spent a lot of the, uh, my uh, airport uh, usage um, upgrading to iOS 11. But like the current state of augmented reality is still like in the very primitive area. So if you think about like what are the new experiences, it's like doing tic-tac-toe in augmented reality. Like, it's cool. It actually got a fair number of views on Made with AR Kit, but you don't really need augmented reality for tic-tac-toe. Um, for a lot of the demos that you see, like the novelty is really just the backdrop of the camera on the real world. So it's just a little bit beyond what Pokemon Go gave you. So this is great for getting the first like demos, the first uh, what people are calling now gimmicks in augmented reality, but it really doesn't bring what is the compelling experience beyond that. So. AR today, a lot of people are viewing it as like where apps were in 2007. It's like, okay, you have the flashlight apps, you have the fart apps, you kind of have different artistic things that people can do, but there's really a lot of like kind of untapped potential and where it can go. And then it, like if you think about where mobile grew, I mean, it's really been this fantastic like kind of exponential growth over time. And then everyone's saying that augmented reality is like, here's where we are right now. Now the question is, is like, how long is this kind of highlighted area? Is this like the next one year? Is this the next four years? Um, so deciding where that is in the mobile augmented reality space. But in order to like look beyond like what are the demos or like what is beyond the demos, um, what are beyond the kind of gimmicks in there, you really need to get down to what are like the core concrete things that developers can really work with today in order to develop the next level of apps. And really that's kind of the question of what is new about augmented reality. So if you think about using mobile as an example, like you had the Facebook app, or you had the Facebook on a website, you could use it there. The Facebook app is just the website version of that. But really, social media began to change into like Instagram and Snapchat. Yes, Facebook is still very relevant, but there are new ways in which you can use the platform that you really couldn't have a Snapchat-like experience um, 10 years before when it was all on PC. Same thing with like Uber. That would not have existed before mobile. You think about in gaming, like what are the new things in mobile that like you could not do under any other platform? Angry Birds was given as an example um, as something as a great game mechanic for mobile, but you could still click and swipe. To my knowledge, 
Pokemon Go is probably the only mainstream AR or mainstream app out there for mobile that you really can't play on a, an iPad or a PC or anything else. It is core functionality is you can walk around with this, you can swipe with it, it involves the camera, and all the different aspects of mobile are all wrapped in together. So for augmented reality, let's begin to break down what are the new aspects and the new things that developers can really work with and care about. So first off, the position of the device um, in the world matters. So then where you place the camera in the world can actually change the game state. Like for this example, here you're actually drawing in augmented reality. So we made a demo of like a Pong game um, where you can actually use the phone as a paddle and then you can begin to go around in the world. You can have different perspectives. So thinking about the position of the phone, if you're thinking about as a developer, like the pose that you have associated with it matters and can begin to change the game state. So that's kind of one of the two fundamental kind of new mechanics that you can begin to play with to design the next level of gameplay for augmented reality. Second portion is the real world becomes content. So this is kind of an interesting concept, and I love the way that it was phrased to me by a game developer that I met about six months ago. And then you can really begin to take the real world into the game beyond just like, hey, placing like, here's a ball in this one location, or here's like a kind of virtual pet right there that kind of just does a quick fetch action. You can actually bring the real world into the gameplay. So this was a demo made by a student out of MIT, um, really, really one step away from a creative genius, or, or evil genius. Um, <laughs> so where you can actually use color um, of the world as a resource. So then the colors of your particular room will actually change the gameplay that you have. So if you want to collect more gold in the world, you can put up more post-it notes. And then found like testing this with some students, like people actually like change up all the colors of the room. They'd like pin up just colored pieces of paper just to get more of the resource in the world. So this is both the game being influenced by the world, but then that influencing the human and then beginning to change the game mechanics too. So this is part of the, like, the cycle that you can begin to see that can really make an experience more engaging. So then that's like one aspect of the world becoming content. The second thing is the geometry of the world can begin to change it. So like we have a demo later on of like the Pong game where you can actually bounce balls off of the real world. So if you're in like a static flat floor area, then you can actually, it's just a fairly simple game. You go into a crowded room like this and then you can be bouncing balls off of people's heads and all over the place. So that is very entertaining and engaging for a lot of the users. Now, this may sound fairly simple, but the, like the two aspects, one, the position of the device actually matters in the world. Second, the world becomes content. But this goes into so many different applications um, and what you can do with it. So these are what we view are the core fundamental building blocks that if you as a developer are working with, these are the new things that are beyond just a gimmick. You can't do this in other mobile scenarios. So talking a little bit more in detail about like what's next for AR. So this is kind of where the current state is, what you can begin to do with it, like what's coming down the pipeline. So this gets into a little bit about what we're doing at Escher Reality. So we're making a unified backend for augmented reality. So you think about AR, you need to understand reality in order to augment it. So what that means is requiring a lot of like the real world data. So like if you're having a persistent experience, then you need to share that across time. You need to share kind of world models across different devices. It's a new problem that gets a little bit technical in how you think about it and get into it, but a lot of new developers are running into the issues of like data management for augmented reality. So what does this mean specifically from a game developer? Because again, a lot of people talk about a lot of things. It's very hard to get very concrete. So what this means is like for persistence. For any type of AR kit experience right now, like you start up the app, you like set a, you set up your own Angry Birds kind of game. The moment you exit out of the app, it's all gone. Everything that you left on the table that you connect to your real world is now lost. So being able to store that kind of persistence in the real world over time, this is a data issue that we're working on solving. So this is going to be used for like 
beyond just what are the quick demo apps that you can like, oh, hey, try this out for 30 seconds, forget it and delete. This is what you need for the recurring coming back to it again and again and again. Second thing is offering shared augmented reality experiences. So this is actually from a second person's phone on a Samsung phone where this is actually me kind of picking up an avatar of my co-founder and then being able to flick it. So having other people be able to come in to and join you in these games and then have kind of hyper-local experiences where you can have like the same way of everyone sitting down and playing Mario Kart together, you can have everyone playing augmented reality experiences in the same location. Like what everyone always really loves is uh, like Rock'em Sock'em robots or actually two Pokemon battling each other and being able to see, see that in real time. So these are some of like the data at the back end. There's a lot of data problems for it, but these are some of the problems that we're solving at Azure Reality. So, and then this is the Pong demo that I was talking about before, where you can actually have like the, the phone move around and be a paddle for the real world and then it'll actually bounce off of the different objects in there. So I want to wrap things up a little bit early because I'd really love to hear a lot of the questions associated with it, specifically from, or not just limited to, but uh, would really love to hear some of the developers' thoughts on this. So first off, like AR gaming is just at the beginning of it. Like people are still figuring it out. It's still really in its infancy. But we personally believe that finding out what are the core mechanics that you can work with, what are the concrete things you can think about over the next like couple months. Because to make a good augmented reality game, like, or to make any kind of mobile game, the development cycle for that, like, you can't just pump that out in eight weeks. Like, this is eight, nine, like, even over a year or of developmental work for people to work on. So then thinking about this at the beginning and what are the new mechanics that you can begin to play with on and try out, like, that is extremely important for not just the industry, but even for the studios that you're working with. Second thing is AR does introduce new game mechanics um, or new mechanics that you can use for different kinds of gameplay. So again, the position of the device actually matters in the world. And the second is the world becomes content. Those are things not seen in other types of platforms. And then as it begins to get like computers adapting to the world. And then this is these simple mechanics are the foundation for any type of augmented reality experience, even beyond gaming. It's just a lot of the, a lot of the problems are being seen right now. <laughs> Lastly, uh, so we are at Escher Reality working on the persistence problems, the multi-user functionality, and then those are the capabilities that are coming down the pipeline. Specifically, we're doing this cross-platform. So the uh, two demos that you saw with the shared experiences were actually across an iOS device and an Android device. And you can be able to see that and share that in real time. So again, having a unified back-end version for augmented reality. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Thank you. So some questions from the audience. Name and then far away. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm Mika Vehkala. Thank you for a great presentation. So I'm wondering about the, the persistence that you mentioned. So what you're offering, if I understand correctly, is some kind of a toolkit for the developers where you can basically you embed it into your application. And then you can basically send whatever information about the world so that you can create a local coordinate space of which then you place any object. And your system can basically store this information and you can retrieve it with another completely other device that's based on some other still AR capable things and you can fetch the information, reconstruct the coordinate space to that device and then place these objects in, in this space so that they appear in the exact same location and orientation. Is this correct? Uh, yes, but adding on to that, so that's both for your own experience, um, so then you would have it on your phone where you like place an avatar on the table, exit out of the app and then be able to like come back to it and see it there. And then the second thing is building onto that, having a shared, a shared persistent experience where your friend could say, I want to log into your kind of gameplay and then be able to see it like after the fact. So then right now we're doing the storage for a single user, but then that data can be shared across different sessions. Um, but that's an active problem that we're working on right now. 
Okay, yeah, my yeah, the, the other question would have been that, yeah, how far are you from <laughs> having this as a released product? Uh, for setting up the kind of persistence, so really what you're doing is building up a three-dimensional map of the world. And then what you need to do is, so we do a lot of the mapping technology on the device, and then we have a back-end API that can store that over time. So then as you begin to like reload and use it again and again and again, it like, improves itself over time because you're getting a more consistent map representation. Now, it just gets fairly tricky when it's, OK, your session and then your friend's session, and then there's a lot of complex networking that goes on um, behind that. So then, uh, well, even for just doing it for a single user. But that's why we're not doing the you share it and I share it this fall. Thank you. Other questions? I've got a question for you, Ross. Sure. OK, so with the, um, the idea of location-based augmented reality, which was probably exposed to the main population by Pokemon Go last year, then you have devices like the HoloLens, which uh, fundamentally doesn't have a GPS unit on it, but fundamentally does local mapping by taking a 3D mapping of the room and creating some database of that, which then becomes accessible by other devices. Uh, I want to get a sense of like uh, what are the differences between what you're proposing and what we're seeing from companies like Microsoft when it comes to that mapping? Uh, so what they're doing is doing the map storage on a device, which works after up to a certain number of locations. So then as you have many, many people kind of having many different maps of the world on their devices, like data becomes a problem. So for HoloLens, like how many like times do you go to a completely new location? They just have a huge storage on there that they can begin to store it. So then for us, the main difference is, one, you can store essentially infinite because you can go to any location and it's dealt with with the cloud because it's like, you're not going to store every file that you've ever touched on one device. Like, we've already done that for PCs. We've already done that for mobile. It's integrated with the cloud. The next step is obviously for augmented reality. The second thing is doing that all cross-platform. So like having a shared experience in like iOS versus Android, and in the future, say, HoloLens. So then, OK, how do you actually unify all of those different devices and the data streams associated with them together? So then if the mapping problem for any one device is difficult, getting a mapping interface for all of them gets a lot more difficult.